Yes, ma'am. Do I need a microphone or a speak loudly and I'll relay? Okay. I I'm wondering about the increase in uh, the tourists uh, that who are going to Cuba. The various uh, travel companies are sponsoring these uh, tours and uh, even some of the well-known travel uh, companies. And uh, you know the. You get the feeling that the situation, the relationship is being normalized, and Cuba is is a uh, untouched, you know, country. It's beautiful, uh, you know, untouched by industrialization and commercialization. Uh, what What do you think about uh, about this? Do you think we should continue to go to? Cuba. I have not been to Cuba, but I, I'm con considering not going. I mean, the, the money we pay, is that going to support the, the horrible regime? We get the feeling that, the, you know, that uh, our, our money is going to help the, uh, the, the working class people, you know, the, uh, support the as grassroots people. Sadly, is that true? It's not true. Sadly, the tourism industry is controlled by the Cuban military and the state security apparatus. So okay. your money will be going to assist the jailers. Secondly, I think there are two issues for tourism to Cuba. One is for the traveler. Um, Cuba, the Castro regime, does not give adequate uh, reporting on epidemics taking place in the country. Uh, dengue, cholera, uh, now we have Zika that's taking place, but there, there have been cases, and I actually met a doctor, uh, uh, Desi Mendoza, years ago, uh, denounced a dengue epidemic where bo bodies were literally piling up, and he was arrested and thrown into a cell, accused of being a liar. And after many months, when the body count was piling up, they had to admit there was a dengue epidemic. Amnesty International recognized him as a person of conscience, and Dr. Mendoza ended up uh, freed from prison, but forcibly exiled. And all he was doing was trying to warn people like you that if you're going to Cuba, there were certain risks you were taking with regards to your health. We know also people who have contracted cholera and have ended up having to pay eight, nine thousand dollars for the medical treatment of US citizens, actually. Um, we also know of other cases of tourists that have been killed or have gone missing. And then there's one case where I dealt with a German couple, the husband was of Bolivian origin, whose wife went missing. And he tried to do a campaign there, he put out some flyers to find out what had happened to her. State security came in, they tore down the flyers and politely put them on a plane out of the country. So you have to remember, this isn't uh, Jamaica. This is a totalitarian country. It's sort of North Korea. But oh, well, I, I don't agree. But, uh, I mean, yeah. there are like a road scholar, I think National Geographic, yeah. you know, those are the companies. And there is CDC who are, you know, I'm sure warning the uh, tourists that there are these dangers, you should take precautions. But there are lag times to get the information. Yeah, out. so yeah. The, your criticism oh, oh, is, that is invalid, really. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me focus on the point here. Um, because yes, there's dangers in most places and, and travelers should be educated and, and if you get sick and you die or something happens. Or oh, take that, shots. That, that's your, that's, you, you know, that's your, obviously, but I think from going back to your question, does it help the Cuban people or does it help the Cuban yes, regime? Yes, exactly. Let's get, to, let's get to that point. So I think I'm all about, there's a balance. You know, there's a balance that needs to be, that needs to be made. And, and we could have a rational debate. When the president announced a new policy, he talked about we wanted to help the Cuban people. So we wanted to have people to people, travel, et cetera. And I'm one that says, okay, let's have that rational debate. How do you help the Cuban people? So they, you know, does travel help the Cuban people? Just measure it from a dollar perspective. If you're going to go to Cuba, and let's say you, you stay at a private home, and you dine at you know a a, a restaurant, which are, they're not privately owned, but they're run essentially by, by individual citizens, etc. You know, there's a, there's an argument there that can be made. We can have a, re, a rational debate about that. Well, what you can't have a rational debate on is when road scholars and all these groups travel to Cuba, and they give you a package tour, and that tour goes and is organized in a hotel owned by the Cuban military. They give you a tour that's organized by a company, a Vanna tour, by, uh, run by the Ministry of the Interior, and they essentially take you around and you come back. The second largest source of income 
of the Cuban state security apparatus, the Cuban military and state security apparatus, Sorry. is tourism. Number one is human trafficking, which is a whole other issue with regards to, to, to uh, exporting uh, uh, human vibes for, for, for money, because there's a huge uptake. The Cuban military hotels magazine documented that the Cuban military runs, has in its power more hotel rooms than the Walt Disney Company. I mean, it is, one of, it is the largest Latin American hotel conglomerate in the region, uh, by far. It's not an Argentine company, it's not a Mexican company, it's the Cuban military in that regards. 80% of the Cuban economy is run by the Cuban military in that sense. So when 90 cents of a dollar, 95 cents of a dollar, because then they say, okay, but yeah, but they'll go and then they'll buy something from a street vendor. Okay, but we're talking five cents of a dollar, 10 cents of a dollar. When that balance goes even to 60-40, I'll have a rational debate. But when we're talking a 90-10 ratio and, these, and, and, and the way that these uh, tours and these and things are organized, and by the way, these military-owned hotels are on properties that were confiscated illegally uh, and haven't been compensated, then it's very tough to, to, to figure out how it actually is gonna help. Now, I, I, I add one point. 3.7 million tourists traveled to Cuba last year. Uh, you have millions of Cuban It's appeal, not just uh, Americans, they're right. coming from Europe yeah. too, well, I one, know. One, mostly Canadians, 1.7 million Canadians went to Cuba last year. Um, John made a, a point which is one of my favorite points. The Cubans love the American people. They always say, oh, I know Americans, I want to be like Americans, etc." And yet, you know, American tourists haven't been in, in Cuba, but Canadian tourists have. 1.7 million of them, compared to 100,000 Americans that travel. Millions of French, millions, et cetera. And you don't hear the Cuban people say, I want to be like the Canadians. I want to be like the French. I want to be like any of them. No, they want to be like Americans, because we stand for something. And my concern is that if we start fidgeting with that, you know, and then we become you know, that, the herd, like, like, like these Canadian tourists are essentially filtered into all these all-inclusive resorts in these keys, et cetera, that are essentially just a money-making machine for the Cuban military. We lose that, we lose that edge. I mean, that's a big concern I have. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to read the question. I thank you for your question because I think it really raises a concern that I think is, is really important. I mean, you know, one says, well, this is the, the tremendous uh, percent of the Cuban economy that is owned by the Cuban military. But in effect, in tourism explicitly, it probably runs to like 95%. In other words, you cannot go on a trip to Cuba and see the sites and not truly uh, afford money to the regime. And the notion, because this, I, I think the heart of, of, of this debate is does tourism promote democracy? Well, China is the second biggest tourist recipient in the world. Democracy, you know, is, is it's immune to this. Uh, tourists have been going to Cuba since the early 1990s. There's no democracy. In fact, all these modifications have, in fact, already been in place. These are just variations of that. But regimes like the one in Cuba are in power because of their ability successfully to repress, and that costs a lot of money. And they and we're run the economy very in inefficiently. So tourism, like remittances, like human trafficking, is money that sort of comes from the sky to them, and they have to, in effect, really provide very little to receive huge amounts of resources, particularly the American tourist, because he is the tourist that spends the most. The regime has gone so far as to subsidize tourists uh, to South America, for example, for image promotion so that they can have access to the American market. Well, it seems as if you activists okay, should well, talk so about tourism well, and its implications. I want to see if uh, Sirlein could also see, if you want to talk about the topic of tourism, going to Cuba, if it benefits the people, or anything else. Well, I can tell you that as a so I can show you how Cubans from inside are living. You're going to see dirt floors, 
homes filled with guano. Traigo video, ya le digo, y fotos que estoy dispuesta a, a entregárselo aquí a la organización. Que los publique, que los muestre. Tengo además el, el deseo de invitarlos cuando yo regrese a Cuba que vaya allí conmigo para mostrarle a Cuba por el and I invite you when I return to Cuba to come and visit me so you can see the real Cuba. <laughs> what tourism is doing is filling up the uh, art, the coffers of the regime. And the more resources, the more repressive and the more terrible that they are. Yo les digo, yo los puedo llevar, que, que hablen con la comunidad. Yo tengo eh, ese, esa dicha de llevarme bien. Puedo pasearlo donde ustedes me digan, al, al municipio que quieran de la provincia de Las Tunas. I can take you through the community, to whatever municip municipality you like in Las Tunas, and, and talk with everyone. A donde quieran ver, para que vean la pobreza que vivimos los cubanos. To see the poverty that we, the Cubans, are living in. Any, uh, yes, sir. I have a question for uh, Julio uh, Schilling. Um, uh, my question goes to your uh, comments about systemic uh, demolition, decommunization. What is your estimate of the uh, divisions among the uh, Cuban Armed Forces, the Office of War, and the security services? What chance of a uh, systemic demolition via a uh, pronunciamento? Oh. Thank you for your question. There, there definitely is uh, divisions within the uh, Cuban Armed Forces. And, and in fact, the regime has structured it in a very decentralized manner precisely to avoid uh, palace revolution, in other words, coup d'etat within the regime itself. Uh, the Castro brothers are the cohesion factor that maintains the regime uh, in, in place. In other words, dictatorships that have uh, what uh, Max Weber, you know, called a sultanistic uh, leadership, you know, charismatic leadership, in effect, is very personalized. And these type of regimes are very difficult to, to topple, more so when you add the fact that it's totalitarian, not authoritarian. Uh, but once that figure disappears, okay, it becomes a, a very big obstacle that is removed. That's why now the, the Cuban dictatorship, it's in a race for its life because it's trying to transform, transfer rather legitimacy from the centralized figure into the party. And the armed forces undoubtedly uh, do remain under the sphere of the centralized leadership of the, of the Castro brothers. But this is why it is so important to continue to, to promote the message that impunity will not be tolerated. Because if people are held accountable for their actions, whether they're in the military, whether they're in the state of security apparatus, whether they're just part of the thugs that the regime uses to repress, you know, plain clothes, when Iran does this all the time, I mean, this is nothing, this is nothing new, it's part of the image, because image does count. And a regime like like the Cuban lives off of the image that it uh, projects. So it undoubtedly, these type of repressive forces must be held accountable. And the message that uh, it is prohibited to forget must be uh, continued. Otherwise, it is not possible to have a democratization process. Can I, can I say something real quick? Okay, sure. I think that you just hit on the most important issue, and it's my biggest concern. Um, I agree with what Julio said, just have a, a slight disagreement. In 1991, when Raul Castro was the head of the Cuban Armed Forces, you know, his entire career he was head of the, of, of the main fight, of the, of, he was the Minister of Defense. In 1991, uh, he, it was the conclusion which began during the purging of the famous general, uh, Hernando Ochoa, was essentially the purging of the Ministry of the Interior. Until then, there had been a separation in Cuba between the Cuban military and the intelligence and state security services. The whole background behind that huge purging of Ochoa and, 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 and the other individuals individuals from the Ministry of the Interior was essentially to have a takeover of the Ministry of the Interior by the Cuban Ministry of Armed Forces. Then in the 1990s, we saw essentially the control of the Cuban economy 
place under the control of the Ministry of the Armed Forces. Cuba today, and what Raul Castro and, and, and has been is it has tried to do almost masterfully from a marketing perspective, is essentially try to hide the fact. But it is, it is the most militaristic dictatorship we've ever had in the Western Hemisphere. The, the economy, the social structure, the intelligence services, all of it is under the control of the Cuban military. And the great biggest danger that we've seen right now in regards to the transition is the economy is under the control of the military with uh, Castro's son-in-law, General Luis Alberto Rodriguez López Callejas, running the biggest conglomerate, Gaesa. The intelligence services are under the control of his son, uh, Colonel Alejandro Castro, who's in the Ministry of the Interior uh, in, in that regards. The Ministry of the Interior is under the control of the main fire of the defense general. And, and then there's the public relations side of it all and things of the sort. But then the biggest concern, if you talk to all the Cuban democracy leaders that are currently here for this stuff, if you say, Rodriguez, Ferrer, etc., as they travel, is this whole question of the dynastic change, etc. And what's apparently obviously clear is that what Raul Castro is doing is trying to make sure that all the centers of power are under the place of the armed forces and that his family is under the control of the armed forces, whether his son in law or his son. And the fact that Ben Rhodes, leading the U.S. negotiations, whose counterpart was Colonel Alejandro Castro, what we're seeing is exactly the opposite of what all of our biggest concerns are. We are empowering the Cuban military. And when things are done here, right now you have the National Defense Authorization Act on the floor on the floor of the Senate. There's language in both versions, House and Senate, which limits the military to military contacts, uh, which is which is something that the Obama administration has been pushing uh, in that regards. The Cuban regime goes nuts. Every time that something happens that, that Congress or tries to check the president in regards to whether it's transactions with the Cuban military, contacts with the Cuban military, et cetera, the White House just goes crazy and, and starts calling all his congressional allies to, to fight back on it. Why? Not because the Obama administration, I think, wants, you know, essentially, you know, for, for the Cuban military to be over, but the Cuban regime, that's their entire succession strategy, uh. is by maintaining the economic, political, and intelligence uh, sources within the Cuban, the, the, the Cuban armed forces. Now, I do agree with you that there are some dissenting Voices there, and that there are others that that are, but it, but but generally speaking, it is the center of all power uh, in Cuba per se. Thank you very much, ma'am. Back there. Well, I um, want to know why European Union considers Cuba to be a threat to Muchas partes del reino me apoyan porque saben que lucho con la verdad y que es verdad lo que denuncio de Cuba. Many elements of the regime support me because they know what I'm saying is the truth and that I'm fighting for a free Cuba. Ahora, eh, recientemente, cuando estaba próxima la visita a Obama, eh, deben de ser conocimiento de ustedes que el régimen cubano, el castrista, dijo que iba a movilizar las fuerzas de la FARC y el MININ para combatir el virus del Zika, los mosquitos. Near the visit of Obama to Cuba, you, may, you should know this, that the regime mobilized the military and the, and the Ministry of the Interior to combat Zika. El, el verdadero propósito de ellos era neutralizarnos a nosotros, a los que pensábamos distintos, a los que pudiéramos eh, mover pueblo, a los líderes entre, entre toda la oposición. The real objective was to neutralize people like us, people who could mobilize, people who thought differently, people who mobilized people, um, the opposition. La gente, la gente de, de, de pueblo, este, eh, parte del régimen me, me alertaron, me dijeron, Inclusive me prestaron el dinero para el pasaje y todo. Eh, cogimos ellos, me dijeron, despreocúpate, nosotros eh, te arreglamos, te, te ayudamos para que puedas escapar, porque esto no va a ser bueno para ti. Elements in the community, elements in, in the regime itself, alerted her to what was going on. 
and actually helped her to be able to get out. On March 7th in, in the afternoon, some of these individuals purchased the plane ticket from a particular travel agency, so it would take time for it to get into the state securities uh, uh, monitoring. And on the evening, of the early morning of the 8th, uh, they took me in a truck to the airport. And for these individuals, it had certain uh, weight with officialdom. Uh, garbage her essentially until she got aboard the plane. She said that there were a number of uh, strange occurrences with the flight number and other things, but she was able to get out because of that, despite that. And I, and I have to thank the Cuban Democratic Director and John for waiting for me at the airport because we weren't sure of how this was going to turn out. Thank you. Real quick, with regards to your opinion, is I think it brings up a very important point. Ironically, and I'm going at it sideways, I think the biggest harm with the current policy that we see towards Cuba is the effect that it's had in the, in the European Union and in the international community. Uh, nothing that the Obama administration has done is going to subsidize the Castro regime because U.S. policy and sanctions are mostly codified in law, and only Congress can change that. So they can kind of complicate things and things of the sort. But they've given the Cuban regime essentially an, an and your legitimacy. In the 1990s, the European companies had gone into Cuba because they wanted to be, they wanted to get there before the Americans got there. In, in, in 2000, there were 400 European companies that had joint ventures with the Cuban regime. By 2010, that was less than 190, mostly because they were all owed money, because it was a bad deal, et cetera, et cetera, and they got tired of waiting you know, for, for some change where they were gonna make money and things of the sort. In 2003, after what was called the Black Spring, which was a major crackdown on the Cuban opposition after the Varela project, um, and, and 75 of, of those arrested uh, were given 15 to 20 year prison terms uh, for their participation. The European Union um, essentially had, they um, didn't issue sanctions, but they weren't economic sanctions, but certain political sanctions on the Cuban regime and its interactions with them, et cetera. Most of that was under the, the leadership, frankly, and what maintained that for years was the leadership, frankly, of Eastern European com countries. Uh, that fought sometimes against the, the interests and the business interests of Western Euro European countries that were interested more in their business uh, and, and things and so forth. The biggest damage that's being done today, that we're seeing being done today, is the fact that in order now, pursuant to the president's policy, to once again be the first in line, to be the first to get, et cetera, the risk.